the graduate program in conflict resolution at UMass Boston is actually one of the oldest in the country. Uh, you know, we had the graduate certificate since the 1990s, and then it was one of the earliest master's degrees in conflict resolution in the country as well. So we have a long established uh, history and I wanted to start at the beginning uh, by letting you hear some of the the um, voices of our students and see a little bit in a in a short video. So hopefully you'll be able to see and hear this. Let me start this. One thing that is really amazing about this program is that it's really hands-on. As a student, you will be put in a position where you experience the real world. We've had a summer institute in Ecuador where I got to learn about intervention that can be used to mitigate this conflict. So you apply the, 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 the skills you learned in class in a real situation. The hands-on out-of-the-classroom learning experience was amazing. I got to go to Northern Ireland. We got to meet with people from all sides of the conflict, and it's something that I don't think I would get anywhere else outside of UMass Boston. I was able to uh, practice my mediation skills under a guided coach uh, in the district court here in Massachusetts. Real life, real time interaction um, in a courtroom setting in which we, the students, had the opportunity to practice our skill set. The court internship equipped me with skills and tools to be able to secure a very uh, competitive program at the United Nations. The conflict resolution program prepares you to go out into the workforce or out into the world um, with a unique skill set that employers are eager to see. I'm excited to wake up in the morning and I'm so happy that I get to do the work that I do. I use what I learned in the conflict resolution program almost every single day. I feel really lucky that I had a cohort around me who were able to help me to not only digest the material that I was learning, but to also put it into practice. It's actually those relationships that helped me to secure the, the current job that I have. If I had to describe my relationship with faculty here and students uh, in one word, it would be family. As an alumni, we can easily reach back to our, in, uh, to our professors for any career suggestion, for any question that we might have. They have as much to teach me in the classroom as much as I teach them. And we very much look forward to meeting new folks who bring in their experiences of life, bring in their approaches to conflict, and together we break new grounds. I would recommend it to anyone that asks about the conflict resolution program. I think for the price, the location being right on the water in Boston, it would be an excellent choice for anyone. I can't think of a better place than to like further education, especially if you're interested in conflict, than here at Conrad's at UMass Boston. This is an environment where I feel like I, I don't even want to leave someday. I think this is something that we together uh, want to uh, welcome students here who really do believe that they can change the world. Okay, so you get a sense there of uh, some of our, our students and faculty and what they've gotten out of the program. Just to give you a bit of an overview about our the structure of our master's degree in conflict resolution. Uh, this is normally, if you're taking classes full-time and stay on track, it's designed to be accomplished in two years. Um, and so it's 12 classes. Each class is three credits. And so normally a full load would be three courses per semester. And so, you know, three, three, three classes times four semesters um, comes to this 36 credits or 12 classes. Um, the required courses are theories of conflict resolution and negotiation are our two gateway courses. Theories provides the the concepts the the theories that you'll need to understand where conflict comes from why it why it happens um and how um how it works and then negotiation is the core skills class where you're learning to apply in practice um the tools to resolve conflicts effectively peacefully and in an effective way um then there's a research methods in conflict resolution course that's a required class usually in the spring of the first year. And there you're learning the tools to be able to do your own research, uh, to be able to understand and consume 
academic um, work on conflict and also um, the basic tools of how to do your own research. Um, and then the the final required course is a capstone seminar. And so that is a class that provides a structure to help support people as they work on their final um, sort of capstone option. And most people do what we call an integrative paper, which is um, a, a, a large research paper that you do in this capstone seminar. So it takes a full semester to do on a topic of your choosing related to conflict resolution. And it's usually more based on sort of desk research. So um, it doesn't necessarily involve going out and doing collecting new data, interviewing or doing surveys or things like that. Um, there is an option if, if you prefer to do something called a master's project or a thesis. And so that would be an additional credit uh, or course worth of credit in the spring, in addition to this capstone seminar, and you would work with a, a faculty member as your advisor um, to do a little bit more in, uh, to do a, a project, also a topic of your choosing, but that does require independent data collection um, out in the field. So you would probably be doing field work or, or interviewing or something like that. So depending on, and that can be more practically focused. So some people, instead of um, just doing research, might want to um, design a training curriculum for um, their local police station. That is something that someone actually did a few years ago. And then the write-up is sort of an evaluation of its effectiveness and a reflective piece about what it was like to uh, pilot that that training curriculum and the project. So there's a possibility for a more applied practical capstone in that way, um, although it would still involve writing it up a, a major paper. So those are the required classes. And then the other requirement is that at some point here, you do some sort of applied internship type of experience. So we have a couple that are sort of off the shelf options that we offer regularly. And those are the easiest for you to do because they're already, um, you know, we we offer them, you just sign up for the class and they're, they're structured. One of those, our sort of crown jewel of our program um, is the court mediation internship. So that's a six credit sequence, um, which is basically worth two classes. And it includes... Um, a, a a class where where you're essentially trained in mediation. You learn the skills and and how to be a mediator, and the um and and then half a day of of a placement in small claims court, either in um, Boston, Dorchester, Quincy, one of the areas right around Boston, um, where you would go and be there. And then as small claims cases come in, um, you might be called on to mediate. And we have a court supervisor who at first, that person would be mediating while you watch and observe. And then you would co-mediate with them. And then eventually you co-mediate with a student while the supervisor watches and provides feedback. So it's a sort of sequenced apprenticeship period that's built right into the class. Um, so that would be one option. We have an intergroup dialogue and facilitation course that likewise is six credit sequence. It includes uh, training on facilitating dialogues. And then um, you would actually facilitate online dialogues with young people from around the world um, through an NGO called Solia. So those are the two kind of prepackaged internship or, or practicum courses that we offer. If those don't work for you, if you have a different interest, it is possible to go and find your own internship. If you, um, we've had people intern, as you saw in the video with the United Nations, we've had them intern with a local refugee agency. Um, we've had a couple of people intern with local mediators and, and do mediation um, that's separate from our secret sequence. Um, and so that would involve a faculty supervisor that you would meet with regularly and provide some sort of assignments, um, reflective journals and stuff like that, and then a placement with an organization. So that's a requirement to do some sort of applied um, thing. And then beyond that, 
you would um, complete the rest of your 12 classes, your your credits, um, by doing electives. And so each semester, we offer uh, a, a few elective courses, which change from semester to semester. So I've listed here some of the ones we've offered recently um, to give you an idea of the scope. We try and have a balance, some more organizational, like work groups or systems in conflict resolution, that someone who is focused, up, or like peace and education, um, so a teacher or a human resources, officer or someone like that um, might be able to find those very applicable to their current workplace. We have others that are more internationally focused and then some that scale um, the immigration and conflict class. Certainly some of that is about what's happening in the United States around immigration and conflict, but with some comparison cases from other, other parts of the world. We've done restorative justice, which also has you know, both international and domestic um, pieces to it. So this gives you some uh, sense of it. Thanks for the question in the chat. Are these day or evening courses? Um, our master's program is built around evening courses because we um, have a history of serving people, many of whom are working full time. And so almost all of the conflict resolution courses that we offer are once a week um, for two hours and 45 minutes in the evening. So a typical class time would be from 5.30 to you know 8.15 or so. Um, that varies a little bit. And occasionally when there's a class that is a crossover between conflict resolution and one of our other graduate programs, like the PhD program, um, it might be during the day. But you know, all of, all of the ones that you would need to take would be offered um, in the evening is our, our typical uh, way of doing this. And I should say that in terms of electives, you are also allowed to take um, other courses that are, are offered in our department by the other programs, especially for those interested in more internationally focused conflict. That can be an attractive option because the other programs are a master's in international relations, and our PhD program in global governance and human security. So there are a number of course offerings there um, that would automatically count as an elective in the Conres um, master's program as well if you were to take those. Okay, so that's the master's degree. We also offer a graduate certificate. And this is a, you know a, not quite as in-depth in a, a commitment as a master's degree. So this is essentially four courses, 12 credits. And it's intended that you could take this in a year um, if you were to take two classes in the fall and two classes in the spring. I should also mention that this option is available both in person and online. This is the only online degree offering that we have in our department. Um, it is possible to complete the graduate certificate completely online and asynchronous. So that's a valuable option for people who work full time and can't commit uh, to coming twice a week in evening courses or who don't live in the Boston area. This is the first one that we've been able to offer where people could take a complete degree program with us and not live in the Boston area. You can do this from anywhere in the world. And uh, you know, so that's a, a useful um, thing to remember. The, um, the pace of the graduate certificate and really of the master's degree um, depends on you. So I'm giving you our typical um, completions that for the master's, if you did everything full time um, and took a full load, it would be two years for the certificate one year. But we have people who can't take two courses per semester and want to spread it out. And that's possible, too. Um, you can take it sort of uh, part time in that way. For the graduate certificate, the same two required intro courses, theories of conflict resolution and negotiation, um, and then two electives. Um, and so, you know, any any two electives that we offer. For the in-person um, certificate, you would choose from the same ones that the master's degree students would choose from. Uh, for the online one, we 
commit that we will offer an online negotiation each year and an online theory each year, and then one elective each semester. So if you did the online option, you wouldn't have a, a lot of choice, uh, but you would be able to complete it. We would offer one elective each semester in addition to the one required course. Um, and I've listed here a few of the online electives that we've offered recently, cross-cultural conflict, third-party interventions. It's a sort of broad survey of lots of things from mediation, restorative justice, circles, dialogue, ombuds work, um, uh, arbitration, and other stuff. Nonviolent action is what I'm teaching this semester, public collaboration. One thing to keep in mind about the graduate certificate, we sometimes have people who aren't ready to go into the master's degree program, either because they don't want to commit to that scale yet, or sometimes, you know, they've been out of school for a while, or they had a rough undergrad um, kind of record and might not be able to be accepted to the uh, master's degree, but they think, you know, they, they'd like the chance to prove themselves. And so they might be able to um, enter in the graduate certificate. And if they do well, if they want to then um, apply to the master's degree program, they can do so. And if they're admitted, then all of those credits they took for the graduate certificate would automatically count towards the master's degree. And so it would, um, you know, it wouldn't be starting over. It would be, it would, those would all count towards the master's degree. Hopefully you can see this. This is just to give you a little snapshot of some of the kinds of things that we're offering. This is our schedule for the spring. Um, so uh, Eben Weitzman, my colleague, is teaching conflict in work groups. Um, Maher Latif is teaching negotiation and gender in conflict. Um, Professor Lakin is pro teaching research methods as well as the online cross-cultural conflict. Eben is also teaching the intro to conflict resolution theory. Um, and then our court mediation um, internship, we have two um, wonderful practitioners, local mediators who teach that course. One of them teaches the course and then they both supervise people in the courts. And then as you see these, the red and the black up here on the top of the chart are the other programs in our department the PhD program and the, the master's in international relations. So those are some additional offerings um, for those interested in, in more internationally focused courses. So this obviously changes from semester to semester, but that's what it will be this spring. Um, in addition to the course offerings, we try to build a robust community of our students and we have lots of opportunities uh, beyond the classroom. Each month we have the Conflict Resolution Colloquium. And this is actually built into the curriculum. Um, oh, each year you're expected to attend um, about five colloquia. Um, so it doesn't have to be every month, but you know the idea is you attend most of them um, throughout the year. And these are exciting visiting guest speakers some of whom are practitioners in areas that we may not offer courses on, but it gives you a sense of different parts of the field. Sometimes there are own alumni coming back and saying, here's how I've used my conflict resolution degree in exciting ways in my in my field. Um, and we have a, a big symposium each year, uh, the Slomov Symposium, where we have a high-level guest speaker come and some training workshops around it and and uh, we feed you at these colloquia so it's a good chance to network amongst other students and with faculty and occasionally we'll have a virtual one as well so that our online certificate students also have the chance occasionally at least to um, do some community building um, in this way we have a student uh, run or a student led organization called beacon to beacon and it, it it's advised by my colleague, Professor Eben Weitzman, but usually the students are, are running the show. And that is designed to offer peer mediation services at UMass Boston, as well as training and outreach about sort of educating the university community about conflict resolution and effective ways of handling conflict. 
So that's an exciting way to really develop some hands-on experience um, in, in the skills that you would use. Um, in, um, so that's something to keep in mind. We also have a summer institute on conflict transformation across borders. This used to be a field course in Ecuador where we would travel, go into the Amazon cloud forest, the the border region near Colombia. Um, and and so it, it was a, a field-based experience on peace building, refugees and migration, border disputes and, and all kinds of things like that with a focus on Latin America. Since the pandemic, um, we haven't been able to go in person to the field, but we have kept it going as an, a, a virtual summer institute. So that's an online synchronous option. So it's like a, a collective Zoom with a series of exciting guest speakers from around the world. So these are leading practitioners and scholars um, on the same themes, right? Conflict, peace building, borders, um, and with a special focus on Latin America. And it is now in collaboration with five different universities in, Brazil, in Ecuador, Brazil, Costa Rica, and Uruguay. And of course, UMass Boston. And so we, it's a, a really diverse, exciting class that um, brings together students from all over the region and, and the world. It's in English, um, but off, this past summer, we had 23 students, most of whom were from other parts of the region of the world. So I would encourage you to think about that as an option as well. We have some funding options to help support students in translating what they learn into the real world. Um, we have one, the, the David Matz Fellowship, or at least we have over the past few years, been able to support students to do internships, to do independent research, sometimes to participate in one of our field courses or our summer institutes. We also have some departmental funding that um, is available to help so that you can apply for. It's not guaranteed that um, can help if you wanted to present some research in a conference, for example. And then the, the graduate student organization at UMass Boston also has some funding that is competitive, but you can apply for, especially to support um, travel and um, conferences if you were to do any of those. There's also opportunities for collaboration with faculty. So some of the faculty have co-authored papers with students, gone to conferences with students, um, sometimes done projects. So we occasionally will get grants and we'll hire research assistants with those funds. And, you know, students can apply for those positions when they come available. Um, there are a couple of limited assistantships and those are competitive um, that folks can apply for that would support part of the tuition and then a stipend. Um, and they're not intended to cover the full cost. They're, you know, they would only cover half of the cost um, of tuition. And then, um, you know, the, but those are, are possibilities and those come in exchange for um, working as a research assistant with a faculty member. Um, as I said, those are very limited. We only usually have a couple of those each year. Um, but you know, for, for the most competitive applicants, that's a possibility. In the department, we have uh, research centers. And so one of them is called the Center for Peace, Democracy and Development. And this is where often uh, we have projects that may be funded by grants or um, a faculty members working on a, a research or a, a sort of practical project and um, often will involve students in these. So right now, my colleague Darren Q has a USAID grant that um, is working on democracy building in Africa. And he has several students, both doctoral and master's students working on that project. And a couple of them even traveled with him to Africa um, to do some of the um, 
the actual network building and a big summit that he had with with leaders. Uh, so that's um, the Center for Peace, Democracy, and Development. We also have the Center for Governance and Sustainability that's more focused on environmental um, issues. The Massachusetts Office of Public Collaboration is not in our department, but it is housed within the McCormick School, where um, you know where we're located as well. And this is the state-funded office in charge of overseeing mediation and public collaboration in the state of Massachusetts. And so uh, they have all kinds of opportunities to get involved in research, in some of their, their practical uh, projects. And sometimes they have funding that people can be hired as graduate assistants um, through that center. And that can be an exciting way of getting some practical experience in this field. And then finally, we have the Mokley Chair of Peace and Reconciliation. Porigo Mali um, is the holder of that chair, and he uh, has done a lot of convening of big sort of summits and, and groups of people from conflict zones around the world, in, especially in Israel-Palestine, in Northern Ireland, in South Africa, and elsewhere. Um, so that's another um, sort of center that's here. In terms of if you are interested in applying, um, we we have folks start each fall for the Masters in Conflict Resolution. For the certificate, we have fall and spring admissions. The, the deadline for the spring admissions has already passed. That was at the beginning of November. So um, for the for both programs, we're talking about for next fall, basically. And the application deadline for both programs is June 1st. But the priority deadline that it would be a good idea to apply for the master's degree, particularly, uh, is February 15th. And funding decisions, I mentioned those couple of limited assistantships, partial assistantships, um, those are generally uh, determined based on those people who applied by the February 15th deadline. If you wait until June of of the June application is pretty unlikely that you would be considered for um, the the one of the assistantships. Um, so if if you wanted to apply, you would go to our website, um, and, and Lee will tell you at the end about that. I think the shortcut is conflict.umb.edu, and that would get you there. Um, but the it, you fill out an application form, pay an application fee, and then you upload your academic history where all you have um, you know, gone to university and it, the transcripts are required for all of those. Um, we would ask you to write a statement of purpose and we give three question prompts that you would respond to, uh, sort of why you want to, um, to um, what you're hoping you would get from this degree program, and and some uh, more about your um, about your background and experience, and then your resume, uh, so we have a good sense of your professional experience, and two letters of recommendation. One thing that I wanted to mention, so in addition to the possibility of starting in the certificate program and then later being considered uh, to move over to the master's degree program. One other step in the ladder, if any of these degree programs, you're not quite sure if you want to commit to it yet, it is possible to take a class as a non-degree program. So it's kind of like sampling the program before you apply to a degree program. So if you just wanted to say, well, I want to take negotiation, no matter what, I'll, I would get great skills out of it. And then I, I'd kind of see how it goes to see if I'm really interested enough in this to enroll in the full degree program. It's possible to do that for most of our classes, not all, but most classes. Um, and, you know, that's explained on, on our website, but um, you would be able to take, I think, up to two of those that could then be applied to your degree program later if you were to apply and be accepted, right? So those aren't um, extra or sort of um, wa wasted, so to speak, if you did end up um, applying and being accepted to the degree program. A little bit about our faculty. We have five full-time uh, tenure stream faculty members in the conflict resolution program, in addition to the other faculty in the department. And some of the things that we do 
um, our organizational conflict, things on race and ethnicity, interfaith and, and religious-based peace building and dialogue, peace education and training, restorative justice, nonviolent action and social movements, activism, international conflict and peace building, negotiation and mediation. So these are some of the areas that our faculty are actively researching as well as doing practitioner work. All of us in the Conres program are scholar practitioners. So we do research, we teach, but we also have work out in the field that we're doing, He's either as active mediators, facilitators, trainers. Uh, in the case of Darren, he goes and does, does election observation in countries in, in Africa and things like that. Um, some people convene restorative justice circles. There's lots of ways that we are um, having a sort of practical role in the field. And then um, our students have gone in lots of directions. We have students who are coordinating mediation programs um, in, in different parts of the world. We have lots of students alumni who have gone on to be ombuds at organizations uh, from universities, um, the the World Bank, the United Nations. We have alumni who have been in charge of the ombuds offices in those organizations, um, who have gone on and founded organizations for online dispute resolution, sports conflict. Some of the sort of cutting edge areas of the conflict resolution field have been led by some of our alumni. Um, and so that's an exciting kind of, of um, track record. And it's wide open. Lots of students have done the kind of things you see here. Um, some have just used their skills to expand their portfolio in their existing jobs. So it's not always that you're gonna go out and be a mediator after you come here. Sometimes it's a set of skills that makes you even more valuable in your current workplace. Um, and you can sort of get a sense of that. There are some videos of alumni panels that we've had and some more description of what our alumni have done on the website. Um, but I did, kind of think it would be helpful to sh let you hear the voices of some of our alumni. What did they do with their training? And what did, looking back, how did they think about the program? So we'll, I, th I think we'll almost end with this. I use the things that I learned here every single day in cross-cultural conflict and organizational conflict that I took with Dr. Matz and and on and on, and negotiation. The work that I did here served me uh, in terms of really understanding how to talk about this when I went looking for work. The professors that you have who can help you network in the community are, are really important. I wasn't looking to go back to school, but I thought I'll pick up a couple of things, you know, learn a couple of things. And I got into the program and I fell in love with it. What I found was there's a lot of people who don't say, oh, we don't need mediation, but what we can use a little facilitation. So you take the same skills and you transfer them back and you learn how to bring people into conversations, learning good conversation skills, how to facilitate conversations, how to get organizations to work, how to get them to reflect on themselves, learning some organizational development. I have Darren's large group methods textbook. I had David Matz talking about Deborah Kolb's The Peacemaker in the back of my head. And I had Sheila Heen and Doug Stone's Coaching and Feedback referenced open with highlights on my desk. So I took the skills, I took the strategies, the theory, the coursework, the information, and I created a role for myself doing the people side of change on a large scale, internationally, engaging in all of these topics.